Hi everyone, today we're going to be talking about Stronghold 2 and the making of in the run up to the new Steam edition this summer. I've grabbed Paul and Simon from the office upstairs and they're going to take me down memory lane. How's it going? Good, good. Excellent. Great. Cool. Let's get going. So looking back at when the games were originally released 12 years ago and, and going back to the very beginning of the whole process, why did you make Stronghold 2 beyond contractual obligations? <laughs> Well, it wasn't even really contractual. I mean, it, it, Stronghold One had been successful, so obviously yeah. the ob the obvious answer is, you know, as a, as a small developer, we wanted to do another successful title. Yeah. So Stronghold Two—that's the obvious answer. The kind of more interesting answer, really, is I think that uh, we felt there was still ground we hadn't really tapped into yeah. in like the medieval genre. Um, so you know, we hadn't got uh, a lot more detail in terms of the sim side, in terms of the economy. Yeah. I mean, we had a game of, that had the obvious sim stuff, but it hadn't really dealt with, you know, things like um, dealing with the waste products of the of medieval village, or <laughs> medieval, <shit>. medieval, <laughs> well, yeah, medieval gong as it's called, and we 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 dealt with uh, things like that with crime and 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 justice, yeah. such as it was, um, but we also dealt with other things. We did a lot more kind of the of the subsystems in a lot more depth. Yeah, it's one of the things I remember because I joined the company right at the end of Space Colony so that was 2003 mm -hmm. and I remember having lunch with you and Eric and I remember you mentioning the big things for Stronghold 2 that you really wanted were it was all about the estate system yeah because that was not that was something you always wanted to, you, know, you wanted to explore you know after Stronghold 1 and also it was the idea of the map would continue on mission to mission so you know your actions in the previous mission would affect what you did in the, in the next mission. Part of the strengths and, and the beauty of Stronghold 2 is it really leaves no stone unturned. Mm. For us the problem was trying to deliver on all of this because we were trying to do open-ended worlds, we were trying to add in this new estate system which kind of mirrored the you know your territory in the mm. game. We added in all the things from Crusader like a whole new set of units, right, yeah. um, we added all of this sim side of things, lots of new sim systems went into the game. Then we, loads more AI. Loads more AI. And then we would start doing things like, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we did cutaway keeps and cutaway towers? So we had this whole new system where you could look inside the towers. I mean, that, as well as adding in skirmish mode, we, we, we threw the kitchen sink into Stronghold 2. Mm. And um, I think we did a, a pretty good job, you know, not just delivering the game, but remaining sane at the end of having delivered <laughs> the game. The other thing is, obviously, it's our first 3D title. So, <laughs> which it seems crazy that we decided to, you know, that was a challenge enough, wasn't it, by itself? No, I mean, the 3D title, I mean, that was one of the big challenges, wasn't it, of yeah. going from uh, One and Crusader to, not only did we do all this stuff, but yeah, we did it in 3D, and we had not made a 3D game before then. Mm. And it's so, still early, kind of, well, uh, early-ish early days of, of 3D, you know, there was quite a lot of... Yeah, the graphics, the 3D graphics were sort of quite basic still around that time. So it's quite, it's quite different from, I mean, making a 2D game where, you know, performance in 2D games was, was great because, you know, computers were exponentially getting faster. And so, yeah. you know, games like Stronghold yeah. we, were, were just running better and better. And then suddenly it was back to kind of square one, if not minus square one. Uh, I mean, I think the, pro the problem was that we were having to, you know, we had to learn 3D yeah. uh, for the first time on top of this other stuff. And it also meant that we were also then challenged with trying to make it look good in 3D. Mm. And we're more focused, on, we've always been more focused on gameplay. So 2D kind of suits us. So with our first 3D game, 3D game we did a pretty good job, but we, we weren't trying to make the most cutting-edge 3D graphic game out there. No. But we had to get it beyond a certain level of the bar, otherwise we were going to get... And you had your own engine, right, as well? Yeah, yeah, so we made our own engine, it, which is another technical. Um, yeah, no, we we, scratch, we had a lot. <laughs> we had a lot. Of, we ate more pizza in Stronghold Two than we did in <laughs> any other Stronghold game. True. But the other thing is, I remember, you know, because you were know, saying about the cutaway castles, you know, you because you wanted all that that kind of to really, you know, one thing people loved about the original Stronghold game was the fact that you know, it was all the, yeah, you know, the people walking around, you could see what they were doing in their daily lives, and you didn't want the cutaway castle. And then, do you remember also did the, you. Know, be able to see within towers. Yeah. And <laughs> so we had that whole system where, you know, troops, you would see troops walking up the towers. Well, they, they would fight. They would yeah, walk yeah, and yeah, fight exactly. their way. 
which is which is brilliant because you know that was the reality of, of a medieval castle life. If you got inside the castle, mm. the towers were designed to the defenders were coming down yeah. and they could use their right swords. Yeah. Going up, you couldn't use your right hand, yeah. and so it was, that was a really nice thing to finally be able to depict. Mm. That was my you know great idea. A complete nightmare for production. <laughs> it was a nightmare. <laughs> it was a nightmare. Yeah. But, but but we've never been you know we've never been afraid of letting a good idea get in the way of a production schedule. <laughs> what were the sort of challenges faced during development <laughs> that you remember? The most interesting kind of nervous breakdowns. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a lot of ordering of. Trying to find a variety in the food that we ordered it's in the evenings during crunch time <laughs> was amazing. After you've eaten pizza for like a month solid, oh, you absolutely. really don't fancy it oh, no. anymore. I mean, we, I mean, it was a, it was three D tech. We hadn't done three D tech before. Yeah. Um, we completely rewrote the engine. I don't know why, but we did. We added in lots of new technical challenges, um, and I think we redid the way that multiplayer worked as well. I think because because it was three D and because we were using yeah, we did actually, yeah. because we were using um, a, a, something that can move in any direction, which looks great because you get smooth turning. Mm. But to do that, you need floating point uh, maths, and that so that means that the multiplayer system we got before had to be rewritten. That was a challenge. What kind of constraints were you working under back then that you don't have today? As a segue from that last point, what's different <laughs> now? Uh, well, we're self-publishing, right? So yeah. that's true. Publisher pressure. We can set our own milestones that make sense, mm. uh, rather than that make sense because it needs to hit someone's quarter, financial quarter, or yeah. they've got a marketing spend lined up here, or a show that needs to, or it needs to come yeah. out before such and such a time. And you're, you know, you're likely to actually be able to deliver on. We know we're much more likely to be able to deliver, but even if we're not, such as you know, it's you know we're a smaller operation as you know Nick. Marketing, you know, we just go to you Nick. We need to delay it a bit. So yeah. I think it, it, take, it take two work. Uh, from my remember, you might, you might have actually got it more in the year, but uh, I think they were you know, they were pretty okay about it in terms yeah. of you know considering. I'm sure some publishers would go go a bit crazy. Wouldn't they? Yeah. No, take two. The last minute you we never, we never really ran into any, you know, into any big runners of take two, but yeah. you know they were flexible. But but you, you you don't need if we haven't got to have that pressure, then great. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So now you know we're free to we're free to choose what we want to do. You know if we want to take it in a different direction, we can do that. Yeah. Uh, we we can set our own release dates. Mm. Um, we haven't you know we haven't got to run through a uh, a particular QA process, mm. jump through hoops. Yeah. You know, we still test. We test, but we test in our own way with internal teams and yeah, yeah. external teams. You don't as get a we build rejected because a pixel is out of the line. No, exactly. <laughs> in, in the old days, we would work on a royalty and advance model. So yeah. we would, ha if we didn't deliver an artificial set of things at a certain date, we wouldn't get paid. Yeah. So it would make us build the game in not necessarily the most efficient manner. Watch Paul and I to amuse ourselves while we were eating pizza, we would put on French accents <laughs> and recount the scene with Pascal Devereaux. Who is it? Is that how we came up with the, uh, the Scouse Axemen? The Scouse Axemen? No, because basically all of the, all of the strong... Norwegians, sorry. No, then the Scouse and the Axemen are uh, Scousers. Oh, yeah. well, and, um, well, they were called Norwegian, though. Yeah, no, they were, they were more Norwegian on their scouts. mother's side. <laughs> There's a line in there which explains it. They go, up, hey, I'm Norwegian on my mother's side. <laughs> no, 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 now it sounds like you did the voice acting, which is not true. We had professionals. Well, my, dad, my dad's a scouser, but I don't think his mum was Norwegian. Um, but we, basically, because we've we got our, our regional accents for the original guys, yeah. you know, so obviously, you know, the Archers were Geordie, they couldn't change. Yeah. But then we had another, another, I think it's like 10 or 10 guys and uh, troop types that came in mm. and they all needed regional accents so we were starting to get a little bit short on yeah. recognisable English uh, accents so hence the need for Scousers in there. Do you remember we had that bug? You know, you know we did Spearman was it? Spearman? With the Brummie accents? Oh no the uh, Man at Arms. Man at Arms. And, but do you remember we had that bug that if you ever selected a group of mixed units it would always default to the Brummy Man <laughs> so you heard him you heard that every, like, literally you never heard anything else apart from him saying 
Yes, sir. <laughs> Whatever it was. <laughs> so you can select a great big group of yeah, swordsmen yeah. and posh knights and everything like that. And you go, all right. <laughs> <laughs> every time, every day, it's just drove everybody crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, not good. Yeah, well, it was. It well, was hey, you can talk you about, we can talk about it years later and laugh. <laughs> yeah. Millions of Steam Edition. What do you think? Um, like remakes, HD versions, Steam editions provide to both our fans and also um, strategy gaming fans in general. Because obviously you've got, you know, Age of X, Y, and Z being having a sort of extended edition or a 4K remaster or a HD version, and these going on to sell you know, millions of copies on Steam and people buy the DLC. And you know, what 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 is it? What is it about? Aside from nostalgia, what is it that people enjoy about? Playing old games again in, in HD or 4K or. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I think I mean Strongholds is a great game, right? I think it's just a great mm -hmm. opportunity to kind of like, to kind of like dust it down, brighten it up, and to fix some of the sort of stuff that mm -hmm. we kind of never really either got round to doing at the time, even after patching. Mm -hmm. You know, you're looking at it again with fresh eyes and going, right, that would be worth doing. And quite often, it's fairly simple stuff. Um, and so we've kind of we freshened it up. We've made it run. We've made it. We've made it kind of bigger resolutions, bigger textures. Because mm. it's a game now that's you know running on better hardware. Yeah. So we haven't got performance problems. It's actually it's almost like it's it's great to be able to put it out again now because it's it'll just run so much better. Yeah. You know, it's literally stuck in two thousand and five. It's you know it's kind of it's designed for uh, you know. Uh, you know, four by three monitors, you know, yeah. <coughs> you know, it's, you know we were, exactly, it's not, it's not designed for widescreen, so you go back, you play it, but it's not actually, it's not as good as you remember, partly yeah. because it's not, you know, it's, it's different now, the technology is like being stretched into something it was never designed to be in, like, I, so you can kind of still, you can take off the rose tinted goggles and it still looks okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Before you load it up and go, oof. No, yeah, exactly. It's not the game was bad, it's just that the technology yeah. now is, ba yeah, is a bad experience. So I think with these, you know, with this, it's like we can bring it back, we can make it feel more like a, a modern, you know, mo um, like a modern day mm -hmm. RTS, but yeah. still with the gameplay that actually people remember and enjoyed back then. So I think, you know, it's a win win, really. For, for players because then it actually delivers on the nostalgia by yeah. actually allowing them to play it in something that feels kind of vaguely modern. Yeah. yeah, I mean we can ramp up the textures, we can make it look a lot better, we can kind of bring it to kind of like a whole new group of people that, that haven't seen it before and in a, in, a, in a way that kind of is a lot more exciting for us because it just runs better, it runs faster, we tidy things up. It's, you know, it's kind of like the game we'd like it to have been yeah. when we launched the original. Yeah. It was a whole new set of fans that have been waiting to do some gong farming. I yeah, <laughs> gong, you can't miss that. You can never do enough gong farming. No, have there been any other games since then that dealt with gong farming? No other, no other games. Did we nail it? I don't think any of the gamers <laughs> laid claim to dealing with shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, quite as, quite no. as thoroughly as we have. No. <laughs> yeah, we aced it. Yeah. <laughs> Cool, well I think we'll end it there. Thanks again to Simon and Paul for coming down to talk about the game, when they should be upstairs doing the real work and not sitting down and having a chat. Uh, but yeah, look forward to Stronghold 2 Steam Edition coming out this summer for free if you already own the game on Steam. And don't forget to like, share and subscribe.